I'm still in it to hold up the mirror to my fellow Republicans to look how ugly they've become in their behavior. Michael Steele, the first African-American chair of the Republican National Committee in 2009 to 2011, he doesn't hesitate to speak out against the Trumpian turn of today's GOP. How unlincoln like they are, how they've turned their back on Reagan, who probably is looking at their dance with Putin and Urban and others going, who are these people? In fact, Michael Steele may have been one of the very first prominent Republicans to critique the emerging GOP shift toward populism. This was back in 2009, when Steele's CNN interviewer described the right-wing radio host Rush Limbaugh as the real head of the Republican Party. Exactly. Like, like, like Rush Limbaugh, who is the de facto leader of the Republican Party. He's no, it's not. Well, I'll tell you what. I've never heard anybody... I'm the de facto anybody, leader of the Republican Party. Then you know what? <laughs> then, then I can appreciate that. But Rush Limbaugh is an entertainer. Rush Limbaugh, his, his, his whole thing is entertaining. Yes, it's Republican incendiary. Right. Yes, yeah, it's, it's ugly. Steele received a ton of blowback for that comment. Was that an early warning sign of today's Trumpian takeover of the GOP? We'll hear from Michael Steele on that topic. It did say a lot about a base that had become very animated and very protective, almost defensively protective, in a way that you could not say or express certain ideas or views. We'll also hear from Michael Steele, former Maryland lieutenant governor and U.S. Senate candidate on the party-run primary elections that drive Americans apart. I think we need to do away with primaries altogether because they're a big part of our problem right now. And they are a seedbed for partisanship. I mean, angry, ugly partisanship, hard-edged partisanship. I'm Robert Pease, and this is The Purple Principle, a podcast about the perils of polarization. It's a privilege to speak with the very candid and charismatic Michael Steele, which I was able to do at the Principal's First Summit in Washington, D.C. That's the city where he was born and raised, or, as Michael puts it, in his very own backyard. Michael Steele, thank you so much. My pleasure. For Good joining to be us with you. Absolutely. Principal. Yeah, it's great to be here. Yeah, you're a very popular man. I had to wait uh, half an hour yeah, in I'm the sorry, lobby downstairs. <laughs> you're in your hometown here. Yeah, in my backyard. I like that. A lot of visitors to the backyard doing the uh, Principal's First Summit here in D.C. And it was good. It's been really good to see citizens who are engaged, wanting to be even more engaged as we get ready for what is an incredibly important presidential cycle. And and we need people to, to really ask themselves, do I really want to give power to someone who says they want to be a dictator? Do I want to give power to a party that, when given a chance to address issues as important as the border, refuse to do so for political reasons? Uh, so this is a part of a, an ongoing, I think, an important national conversation. Well, it's an incredible moment. I don't know if you have this recurring dream where you wake up and it's 2005 or whatever, and people were <laughs> rational, and you didn't appreciate right. it at the time. Right. But uh, you'd be surprised. No, maybe you wouldn't actually. At the number of people, you know, Robert, who think that, who say that to themselves, like, oh, gosh, I remember when, or I wish it were like, and and it's interesting because at that time you just you were going through something. You know, there may have been some big political battle. You know, you know, regarding the war in Iraq or the economy or something like that. And we were focused on policy and national security and economic and other issues, not personalities and not pure politics, raw politics, tribalism. Although there were elements of those things that were beneath the surface. The difference was our body politic kind of contained them and our politicians were not the ones to uh, elevate those aspects or elements up through the political uh, skin. And then the reality of it is, you know, now you got this infection, you got this rash, and it's spread and it's growing. And yeah. now we're at a point where we can't seemingly stop it. But yeah, it's a, it was a different time, a different nature of politics. Politics in this town. I grew up here in Washington D.C. And so I've seen the politics of this town firsthand for a long time and know it well. And, and this is a very different space and time. Public service means nothing anymore here in this town. It's all about, you know, owning the libs or getting the grift or 
shutting down the government or whatever. It's all theatrics. It's all performative. Yeah. It's not policy-based. Well, let's go back to an episode where you were chair of the Republican National Committee, first Mm African-American. You had a national reputation from a speech at the Republican convention. You're lieutenant governor in a very blue state, working in a bipartisan way. And people came down on you for saying Rush Limbaugh was an entertainer. <laughs> Limbaugh saving his response for his radio program this afternoon, ranting for 20 minutes, alleging that Chairman Steele cares more about being a pundit than about running the party. And it just seemed like, in hindsight, maybe that was the MAGA base. Maybe that base was under formation, and we just didn't realize how powerful it would become. Well, I, I, no, I, I think there... Yeah, that that base is very different from this base today. We've had Tea Party since then. Was not Tea Party so much uh, at that time because that occurred within like the you know the early part of my tenure as chairman, and and so I, I don't. The funny part about that is Rush Limbaugh and I, you know, a lot of people didn't know, and there was really no need for them to know because you know it wasn't something I went around and talked about. We were good friends. Um, when I was state party chairman in Maryland, I invited Rush in to do a big event for us in Maryland, and he did. He came and spent time. I think we were at University of Maryland at the time, and um, did this huge event for us, uh, for me as a favor. And I would sometimes appear on his radio show as a guest. You know, just come on and talk about. Rush was one of the ones uh, when I was very young in my career that was such a beacon for a young conservative like myself back in the early 80s, you know? Um, This new platform emerging in talk radio that, you know, you heard conservative voices talking about the issues of the day. But Rush also entertained us. And I don't care if people found that offensive. The reality of it was, as I said to Rush, I said, Rush, I was just quoting you, right? Because Rush referred to himself on a number of occasions as an entertainment. That's what he was not... He was not a political leader. He was not a politician. He was not an elected official. He had a radio show. And what is radio but a form of entertainment? And it is a place and a platform where you go and have big, broad discussions and, you know, have fun talking about stuff and sharing points of view. But if it's boring, you don't listen. Yeah. (laughs) Right? If there's nothing that gets your juices flowing, you don't tune back in. Yeah. That's what he did. Yeah, he was a master. Yeah. And that's what I was referring to. But the funny part about that was uh, when that story broke and everyone got their, you know what, twisted up, I called up Rush and I said, dude, how long have we known each other? By that time, it had been at least 10 years, right? Longer, actually, because I was chairman in 2000. So, yeah, about 10,000. Yeah, about, so it was 2010, 2009 in that space. So, and I said, we've known each other a long time, and, and you know me, I know you. And we had a great laugh. We had a great laugh about it. But two things I learned from it. One, the next day Rush goes on his radio show, does not mention the fact that he and I talked hmm. and that he was okay, but instead blew me up. Michael Steele, you are head of the RNC. You were not head of the Republican Party. Tens of millions of conservatives and Republicans have nothing to do with the RNC, and right now they want nothing to do with it. And when you call... Which proved to me he's an entertainer because it pumped up his audience and it got more people to listen because they wanted to know how was Rush responding to what all of this was. And the second thing I learned from it, the first being, you know, yeah, you're going to get punked. Uh, by the people you think wouldn't do it, they're going to do it. And the second thing I learned from it was uh, more about the base because what happened at that time was we had a contraction in our fundraising uh, at the RNC for about three weeks because people were so angry that the RNC chairman said that Rush Limbaugh, who's an entertainer, was an entertainer. But they didn't want to hear that. Yeah, They didn't want to hear that about him because then it somehow cheapened what that experience was they were having with them. No, it's just being honest about what that experience is. So you're building it up to be something that it really isn't. He's allowing you to do that because that's what entertainers do. They help create. And this is really kind of the first sort of immersion into sort of this reality, kind of this 
reality TV, reality radio kind of experience where you kind of, the characters are so real to you that you sort of take it at face value. Yeah, it's their identity. Uh, right, and, and becomes part of identity. Yeah. And, and that I think that's an important also, another lesson to take away from that experience that you could see how these personalities that were emerging in the political ether were shaping and reshaping not just the political narrative and conversation, but the political identity of those who were listening. Yeah. And we've had several psychologists, neuroscientists on the show talk about how identity has collapsed into politics. It used to be you'd have a religious identity, right. sports identity, and they were, music they identity. They were kind of separate. And there yeah. was, you know, cross cleat yeah. you know, cutting of identities. Now it's like it's everything yeah. rolled into one. No, very much so. We're speaking with Michael Steele of MSNBC. He's a former chair of the Republican National Committee, which is now, just 15 years later, co-chaired by Trump loyalists, including his own daughter-in-law. Steele was also a Republican lieutenant governor in the very blue state of Maryland when both chambers of the legislature were controlled by the opposing party. Nevertheless, the Ehrlich Steele administration, they reached compromises with Democrats on numerous issues, including health care, environment, the budget, and taxation. So I asked him, what is lost in our current trend of single party control in 40 out of 50 of today's state governments? I think we lose a lot. I think we become stagnant in many respects. Look, I, I've always been an advocate of using the system that I'm given to create the opportunity for the candidates that we're running, for the message that we're conveying, and for the ideas that we want people to make a part of their own orientation, things that they can trust and believe in as well. And I grew up here in Washington, D.C., where there was no Republican party life or existence. I mean, it, it was there, but they weren't winning in the elections. They weren't changing the city. They weren't, you know, anything that uh, anyone that members of Congress would value in that relationship between the federal city and, and the uh, Congress. So that I brought a lot of that to the RNC. We fought very hard back in the day to create a level playing field for Republicans in states where we were outnumbered. And where I focused on that was, okay, state legislature. That's where the action is. So if you want to change the game, and I tried to very much change the game here in Maryland, wound up getting myself and Bob Ehrlich elected governor and lieutenant governor, you know, we were the first Republican tickets in Spiro Agnew to win statewide. Wow. And so that's a real, a real testament, again, to this creating that lane for those voices to emerge and people will respond to them. So I've never been against redistricting as a tool. Now, can any tool be abused? Absolutely it can. But as I tell a lot of my Democratic friends who now whimper and whine about Republican hegemony and, and using redistricting, y'all weren't screaming about redistricting when Democrats controlled the United States Congress for 40 years, mm -hmm. between 1954 and 1994. Everybody seemed to be perfectly okay with one-party rule of the House. Yeah. And that one-party rule in the House existed. Why? Because there was one-party rule in state legislatures who drew the congressional lines that put those members in control for 40 years. So can there be abuse of the system? Absolutely, on both sides. But as a tool to create leverage and to re-level the playing field, yeah, I think redistricting, redistricting is a legitimate tool for that. But as citizens, we have to be mindful of it's, how it's used, which is why I've been a strong proponent for a number of years over redistricting commissions, taking it hands out of the politicians who are drawing lines to protect their seats yeah. and putting it in the hands of citizens and former judges and experts in line drawing, just to break it down simplistically, 
who then look at the map uh, of a city, of a state, and draw the lines that best bring out the representation you, you need. Yeah, well, there is maybe a little bit of progress on gerrymandering or anti-gerrymandering in, in recent Wisconsin decision. Right. In New York situation. Right. But there's also a lot of energy at the state and here in D.C., the district level, to open primaries and implement ranked choice voting. Love it. Um, More make, of it. Make all votes count D.C. Largely, from our interviews, it seems it's Democrats who want to make government work better. There are people who've been in power. But for, there are Republicans who've done it, too. You, yeah. you, I give you the state of Alaska, where yes. you have in places like... Uh, Colorado, which is a little bit more purple than than uh, yeah. blue in any given cycle. So you do have states, I will give you the more, more Republican states that are less, less interested in that because they don't understand it or they believe it to be something that it's not. But you're also seeing at the same time more and more Republicans recognize the value of that tool. Uh, there's some of us who are looking at having this conversation uh, in Republican primaries to avoid the kind of crazy stuff that we see happening in primaries. And so if you do something like ranked choice or final five uh, mm -hmm. voting where on a date certain everyone jumps in the pool and the top five go to a general election in the fall, then ranked choice voting then right. uh, the Alaska model, yeah. Yeah, creates the eventual winner. I think that process is much more civically oriented, much more citizen-minded in the sense of citizens now have the ability to say, you know, I like Robert, I like Michael, I like Sam. And so if I'm asked to preference that, okay, I'll put Robert number one, I'll put Michael number two, Sam number three. And, you know, now I've got all my choices in play and we'll sit back and see what happens, right? So yeah. it's, it's much more about civic citizen engagement. Our system right now is designed to tell people not to play the game. They don't want you. For folks out there, next time you're in a room of 20, 30 people, ask everybody in the room, how many of y'all believe that both parties want everybody who can vote to vote? And I guarantee you not one hand goes up. And if a hand goes up, they're lying to you. <laughs> I just did this in, I did three sessions a few weeks ago, completely different audiences, Florida, Philly, and Arizona. So you now have a sense of the mix, right? Yeah. 500 people, 600 people in the room asked that question. Not one hand went up. And I knew the room was stacked with Democrats and Republicans. Not one hand went up. And what does that tell you about how people, not what they think, but what they know about our current system? It's not that they don't trust what's happening at the ballot box. They don't trust the system to protect the ballot box. And they watch as state legislatures and others strip away voting rights, strip away access to the ballot box by making it more difficult, and their trust becomes less and more and more, or less and less, rather. So the opportunity to sort of open up this door and allow more voices in, allow more ways in which we can engage citizens, I think is in a very, very important next step. Our featured guest this episode is Michael Steele, currently an MSNBC host and commentator. Steele is a featured speaker at this year's Principles First Summit, the traditional conservative alternative to the Trump-dominated CPAC conference. And Steele's address there exhorted the 700-plus attendees to get to work on reclaiming the GOP and maintaining our democracy. But it's time, folks, to get busy. It's time to get serious. It's time to stop making excuses. And it's time for each one of us to stand up as part of we the people, the legacy that's been handed to each one of us to help strengthen this country and to move it forward. You just can't sit on your ass and think someone else is gonna do it because they're not. You have to lead now. You have to be the leader now. In my interview with Michael Steele, I asked for his thoughts on the current presidential race that, according to many polls, deeply disappointed many Americans by renominating President Biden and former President Trump. Maybe not so surprisingly, Steele, who's a lifelong political catalyst and organizer, he pushed back on that description and the tendency for many Americans, of all parties and persuasions, 
to throw up their hands and disengage. Can I just stop right there? Can I just stop right there, please? And this is where I think we lie to ourselves. We lie to ourselves. Literally, we lie to ourselves. When you, and not, I'm going to you, you, use the word you broadly, not mm-hmm. you specifically. But when you tell me that this is an election no one wanted, these are candidates no one wanted, that's just a bold-faced lie. It's an absolute bold-faced lie. We know why? Because in 2016, 16 people ran for the presidency of the United States on the Republican side, and they chose Donald Trump. In 2020, Donald Trump told the party, you don't run anybody against me. And those numbnuts said okay and kept him on the ballot. So there's that piece. On the Democratic side, in 2020, you had a choice other than Joe Biden. You had a whole lot of very young people. So now complaining about Joe, he was old then. What do you think he's going to use in in four <laughs> years? He's going to be older. So why are you now complaining about the fact that the man is 81? You voted for him when he was 77. So I don't understand it. You had younger players, accomplished governors, senators, former attorney generals running for the office. If you were so concerned about age, if you were so concerned about, you know, oh, well, we don't want this or that person, you know, for the nomination, then why didn't you select who you wanted? So stop it with this, oh, you know, this is not the election we want. Well, then have someone run that you want or support someone else other than who is running that's in the race. So my point is this. We, as citizens, check out and then look back in and get all upset at what we see, right? And that's not civic responsibility. Your responsibility is to stay checked in. That's what the founders expected when they said, here, you have the power. Our government is of, by, and for who? People, not institutions, not parties, not one individual. So we have the responsibility. We choose the government that we want. We choose the leaders who are an extension of us to represent us in leading that government. So all this whining about Joe Biden, get over it. He's the nominee for the Democrats. All the whining about Donald Trump, get over it. He's a nominee for the Republicans. So now your civic responsibility is going to be to go to the polls in November and vote for one of them or vote for none of them. But just shut the hell up about this is not the race that I didn't want, because guess what? This is the race you chose. And by you, I mean all of us collectively, a majority, because that's how we operate, right? Majority decided this is who we want. Well, I think independents are complaining that they can't vote in some states in partisan. Then independents need to vote for state representatives who support allowing independents to either be recognized as a party in their state, or to open up their primary so independents can vote in cross-partisan primaries. That's what you do. You have control here, people. If you want power in for something in your state, elect the men and the women who support you in that, who will give you that power, right? You already have it. They just now have to codify it. They now have to make it constitutional. They have to now make it legal. That's what that process is there for. But if I want something and you are the one who can give it to me, guess what I'm doing? I'm getting behind Robert for office, right? I'm getting behind Don for office. I'm getting behind Mary for office because Mary, John, Robert are going to support the thing that I want to have done. We have to check into the system and stay checked in. We can't just check out and then get mad when stuff don't go right. Oh, well, I can't participate. Well, why can't you participate? They won't let me. Well, why won't they let you? Uh, I don't know. Well, make them let you. Well, we've had some notable Republicans on the show who've decided to leave the party. We talked about Kerry Healy. Right. We've had others like Will Hurd who decided to stay. Mm-hmm. You know, he ran in the presidential primary, didn't get much traction. Where are you in that thinking? Do you still view yourself as a Republican? I am. The- Card carrying, hardcore, you know, Republican, conservative on a number of issues, maybe not so much on a few others. And I'm a Republican because I was here first. (laughs) All these wannabes who just showed up calling me a rhino. Really? Donald Trump? Seriously? I know your backstory. So the reality of it is this era of projection, 
by some in the MAGA community, like somehow they are the keepers. They are, you know, they're holier than Ronald Reagan. Please spare me, right? The reality of it is their core principles and values that still matter to me as a Republican. They were formed at the founding of this party that spoke about individual rights and liberties, period. The libertarian nature of our party is real. It always has been. It's why we, you know, for generations very much believed the government has no role in your private life and the decisions you make regarding your family, your health, your business, your faith. And a lot of us still believe that, right? But now we see a Republican Party that is telling women that if you cross the borders of this state to have an abortion, you're going to jail. Or that your rights, which have now been taken from you, we're going to mandate further that in these circumstances, in these situations, you're not allowed. I mean, the government now telling people how, what, where, when, why they do and how to behave is not something that any conservative, especially, um, but a Republican would never advocate for because we believe those rights have been given to you, um, given to you by God and manifest in our Constitution. And so I'm here for now. We'll see how long that lasts. Mm. But the fight for me right now is just to say, no, this is not who we are. Why are you doing this? For Trump, Trump doesn't care about you. Trump never cared about you. You're just a pathway for his personal ventures. And it's unfortunate that people get suckered in like that. Yeah. Well, great to have you on the show. It's we, great we, to be with you. So Thank you so much. appreciate your perspective oh, and your insight. Appreciate it. All right, my friend. Thank you. We've been speaking with Michael Steele, a man of many firsts. He was the first African-American lieutenant governor in the state of Maryland, first African-American chair of the RNC, and possibly one of the first prominent Republicans to voice concern over the gradual but unmistakable takeover of the GOP, first by far-right radio commentators and ultimately far-right voices on all media platforms, print, radio, cable, and social. But that takeover is not absolute. It's not 100%. As we've heard from Michael Steele and in another recent conversation with MSNBC columnist Charlie Sykes. The people who are the internationalists, the Nikki Haley's, the people who do not want to embrace Vladimir Putin, who do not want to abandon Ukraine, they are an endangered species in the Republican Party, but they are not extinct yet. And also from 2024, GOP presidential candidate, Governor Asa Hutchinson. So the major issues to me would be, you've got to tackle the immigration, you've got to tackle uh, your relationship in the world, and you're going to be a trustworthy ally as the United States of America under your leadership. You've got to address the balanced budget, and neither of the two political parties are talking about that. And in our next episode, we'll hear from several attendees of the 2024 Principles First Summit in Washington, D.C., who represent traditional conservatives, valuing nation over party, principles over politicking, and who could be the deciding factor in the 2024 presidential race and many down-ballot races, too. Center-right voters, center-right leaders are the key to saving American democracy. I'd like to feel like there's some movement towards creating a better political environment in the country where people aren't motivated by, you know, malice and rumors. That's the key thing, to have a value that you will vote against your party for, even if sometimes, because that's really rare today. Questioning where my political ideologies sat, even when I was interning on the Hill for a Republican. We hope you'll join us for that episode. Check us out on YouTube, social media, and our website, purpleprinciple.com. Many thanks for listening. From the whole team here, Kevin A. Klein, senior audio engineer, Alex Caro, associate producer, Trevor Prophet, digital ops and strategy, Sarah Kim, research and fact-checking, and Mary Claire Cogler, video production and editing. The Purple Principle is a Fluent Knowledge production. Original music by Ryan Adair Rooney. 